Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we actually started this group back in April of 2020, kind of in response to COVID. Uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, you know virtual meetups going on at the time, so I thought it'd be cool to just start something up and push it hard on LinkedIn to try to get people to discuss different commercial real estate topics. And since then, we've had a phenomenal amount of uh, reach and people have been tuning in from all over the world. And we've had phenomenal speakers come in to talk about a variety of different concepts. And today's no exception. We have Patty Asai, who I've actually interviewed on another po a podcast that I run, the Commercial Real Estate Academy. And she provided so much insight on that podcast. I said, we got to get her on the, the meetup to talk about her experiences and really focus on a topic that's super pertinent to uh, business owners and also investors, uh, which is the SBA financing process. So Patty, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. No, we're excited to have you. So, you know, I know a lot about you just through the, you know, interactions we've had in the past, but it, I'm sure there's people out there that don't necessarily know. And I'd love if you could share a little bit about your background. That'd be great. Sure. So I started out as an attorney. I was a criminal prosecutor for about five years um, in Chicago. And I moved to California. I was going to go practice law. And um, I just kind of fell into financial services. And I've been in financial services now for I would say over 20 years. Um, I started in the merchant services group at Wells Fargo and I just kind of worked my way up. And now I'm the SVP. I, I typically, I do all SBA financing with a focus on mergers and acquisitions, partner buyouts and expansions. Awesome, that's great. So could you, and that's the, that's great you mentioned that because you know obviously the SBA financing piece encompasses you know not just the 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 mergers and acquisitions and biz buy, partner buyouts et cetera, but it also encompasses you know things pertaining to the real estate space, which I know is kind of what a lot of people within our call are are focused on. So I was kind of wondering if you could ex, uh, explain you know the SBA financing options in general and what and I guess even more so to kind of elaborate. You know, when what scenarios would it be appropriate to pursue one product over another? Sure. So for us, as, as far as commercial real estate, we will do uh, commercial real estate that others won't even touch. So we'll do car washes, we'll do gas stations, we'll do assisted living, we'll do single purpose uh, use properties that, again, most SBA lenders don't touch. And so as far as um, SBA financing for commercial real estate goes, you have two options. You have the 7A and you have the 504. So the 7A is typically used for specialty use properties. Like I said, the, the, the ones that we do, any properties that are high risk, that you, you would use a step, the 7A product on. And um, our 7A product and most 7A products for real estate, we go out 25 years, the 25 year fully amortizing. And the prepayment penalty is just three years, so it's five three one, and after that you can refinance it out. Um, but you know it is a variable rate that adjusts quarterly, and a lot of people on the seven A product um, they're asking me now, well, can I get a fixed rate? Can I get a fixed rate? And I always say this is the worst time possible to get a fixed rate, right? Rates are so high. So what you want to do is you want to get a variable rate because inevitably rates are going to go down and you want to take advantage of that. Once they go down to historic lows, if we ever get, get there again, but at that time, you may want to fix the rate. But at this point, this is not a time to fix the 7 rate. Okay, so sense. yes. So then you also have a 504 product. And we just started doing the 504 product. We typically focus on 7 As, but we, we do have that available. And depending on the bank, um, for both products, you have to bring in 10%, right? But depending on, depending on the bank, it, it really depends on the 7A. But on a 504, you bring in 10%. Um, the bank covers 50%, and then the SBA covers 40%. So that's kind of the way that structure works. And the 504 product is used for non-specialty use real estate, right? Anything that's generic, anything that's plug and play. And if you have a situation like that, I always say go with the 504 because you get a fixed rate, you know, there are terms between 20 to 25 years, and the rate is going to be a lot lower uh, than a 7A. But again, you really have to qualify for the 504 product, because not all products fit into the 504 program. That makes sense. No. So so would you say more so it, it, on the 504 versus the 7A? For 7A, it's the, you know, the partner buyouts, the mergers and acquisitions. And then if you have more of a risky play, whether you described it, which is the car washes, the the, the gas stations, maybe, I don't know if hotels fall in line with that or anything like that. Exactly. It does, yes. So so in that case, you know, the 7A product. 
restaurants. Yeah, that's great. So the sad seven, a product, you know, typically if you're focused on that, whereas with the, the, the 504, is it more like owner? I mean, I guess, is it owner user type of products or yeah, like if so, I'm a, go ahead. Yes. All SBA products are owner users. So you have to be, oh, yeah. it has to be occupied. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so with the 504, it would be a more general space. So a, a space thing for this way, if a space cannot be utilized for something else easily, like a restaurant, right. You have a kitchen, you like, it's not easy to go in and put office space in there. So that's the kind of way that you think through it. Mm -hmm. So if it's not easy to convert to another type of business, that would be special to use and you would use 7A. But for anything other than that, warehouses, office space, anything else like that, you use the 504 product. And you know, I, I always say that the only reason that you would use the 7A product, right, would be, for example, us, we provide 100% financing on, um, on commercial real estate pro deals where it's a rent replacement deal. So let's say you're paying rent at your current location. You either want to buy that location or move to another location and buy that property. Then we can do 100% financing on the 7A product. And regardless of what type of property it is, I mean, you could use 7A for all properties. I'm just saying you wouldn't want to with 504, but the only time you would is, for example, if you're buying an office building or a warehouse, you don't want to put anything down. We could finance that with 100% financing. It is, like I said, a variable rate. But after three years, you can refi that out without any prepayment penalties. No, that makes that makes complete sense. Um, sorry, I think I, I went dark for a second. No, but that makes that makes complete sense. And, and I'm glad we were able to clarify that sl uh, slightly. So one of the things that I'm kind of curious about, and this is obviously just for, for me and hopefully it benefits the audience as well, is, you know, ground leases. I feel like they're becoming a lot more prevalent in our market. I know in other parts of the country, you know, that's a lot more prevalent, you know, the East coast, you know, I know in Florida, that's pretty common as well. I'm sure in California, there's situations where ground leases are present. I guess, how does that, how does the SBA uh, ha handle those scenarios? Cause there's a lot of, uh, you know, situations where, you know, you may see a piece of ground that is a phenomenal location for a particular use and they want to do a ground lease. Is that something that, that can be done? Uh, yes. As long as the, the lease is at least the term of the loan. So on a commercial real estate property, it's 25 years, then at least as long as the lease is for at least 25 years, you're okay. Because they just want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're not going to be kicked out after, after a certain period of time, right in the middle of the loan, right? And, and that goes for all, even if you're doing business acquisition loans, for example, you're leasing a property, you have to have a lease at least for 10 years, or it can be like a five with, with an option to extend to 10. Okay. That makes more sense. That, that makes awesome sense. So uh, one thing I was kind of curious about as well is, you know, we've had a couple of people in the chat kind of type on it and about it is, you know, th there's certain uses that I know kind of fall under the seven, a category where I think this could be a prevalent for is, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are, they're looking at self-storage facilities. There's mm -hmm. people out there looking at car washes, even co-working spaces. I've heard that, you know, mm -hmm. they've started to approve them over. I mean, and I had a communication with a lady out of Detroit, uh, about a year and a half ago, and she actually was able to seek uh, SBA approval for her co-working space that, that that she ultimately purchased. And obviously, that's a lot rarer than other types of uses. But if you could expand a little bit about, upon, you know, maybe some of the hurdles that that people face when they when you're focused on those types of properties, or you know, maybe any other insight you could share as well. I mean, you, it really, it's risk. That's the bottom line. It's it's the riskiness of okay, so I'm buying this property, and if my business doesn't work out, right? I can't have another business just come and plug and play right here. If I'm a restaurant, I need to have another restaurant at this property out, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I am a car wash, I need another car wash to buy my property out if the business doesn't work out, right? Mm -hmm. So I think mainly it's risk of those properties. Um, and that's why you do a 7A loan on, on those. And again, every bank has a different appetite. You know, for example, we don't do hotels or motels. Um, other banks do, but we will do, like I said, car washes. We'll do storage facilities. All day long, we'll do those. Um, assisted living. All day long, we'll do those. Okay. And, and, and in your case, you know, does that, has that shifted over time? So, you know, in your, in, with your guys' appetite for different product. You know, how, how does that, how has that worked over time? I, I think, uh, yeah, you do definitely have to assess the risk based on time, right? So mm -hmm. when COVID happened, 
we weren't doing restaurants, <laughs> right? I mean, it's very, very risky. So we really stopped doing a, a restaurants and being in that industry. Um, now we will do them on a case by case basis. Of course, you know, hopefully COVID is mostly behind us, right? And uh, we're, we're opening up to restaurants again. But yes, I mean, the, the climate and the economic climate really does affect, you know, our risk appetite. And everybody else is too. It's not just our bank, but all other banks feel are the same. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I guess another question I kind of have is, is in our current environment, obviously interest rates have been ticking up and, you know, I've had, I've seen it on my end where deals are starting to falter as far as the, you know, the, the, the financials go. So I guess, how has that been affect, how has that affected, you know, some of the deals that you've been working on in a variety of different property types? Right. So it's, it's going to be harder to cash flow because the interest rate is high, correct? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're paying more. So the, the, ca the cash flow, we, we require, you know, 1.2, 1.25 on commercial real estate. And, you know, the beauty of the 7A and the 5 core is that you're going out 20, 25 years, right? So the amortization is long, so you can easily cash flow for it. But the rates being so high now, it's making it difficult for those companies to cash flow. So, yeah, it's definitely hurting, um, you know, our business and everybody else's business. But again, we're, we're hoping that rates will, will, will come down soon. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, you know, I, you're right. I, I think at a certain point, you know, the Fed's going to have to make make some Absolutely. changes. I, I think I think it was important for us to do this. We probably should have been doing this years ago, to be yes. honest. But yeah, understandably so, yes. understandably so. COVID, you yeah. had you had to kind of do things a little bit more drastically than you know maybe would have been warranted in a normal environment. But uh, yeah. I think that it was necessary, and I'm hopeful that in 2023 things do start to tick back down and activity continues to to grow as a result. And um, one thing I was kind of curious about is let's say that, you know, you begin working with someone uh, who's looking to secure a uh, SBA loan. You know, what are some of the things that you would request on the front end uh, to make sure that, you know, they in fact are ready to go so that when the opportunity presents itself, they're ready to strike? Right. So uh, really here is one, one of the catches is that I, I get a lot of calls saying, well, can you pre-approve me for an SBA loan? And that's a little hard to do because we underwrite to the business, right? We don't under, underwrite to the individual unless you have a space that you know that you want to buy, what the terms are. It's really hard to get pre-approval. But I, I would say that what you need to do is you need to make sure that, that your financials are ready to go. So you have three years of tax or, or personal tax returns. So, I mean, basic package things are three years of personal tax returns, resume, a, a personal financial statement. If you have those things ready to go, you're, you're ahead of the game. And then, you know, for the business, we will ask for three years of tax returns. We'll ask for interims. We'll ask for projections, a business plan. A business plan is really important. That's, that's a lot of time times where there's a delay because you don't have the right business plan. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that kind of slows things down. I mean, you need that a little less on commercial real estate, but we still need to know, like, if you're buying a property, what, what you're doing with it. So those are the main things that you should really consider. That makes sense. No, for sure. Um, and, and last, last question before, cause I know we wanted to kind of open up to Q and a, uh, yep. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, people have the ability to be able to do, to ask these questions is, you know, what are some of the pitfalls or the, the mistakes that you see people make throughout the process? Because, you know, let's say that I'm, you know, start working with you. I provide you with this, this information. What are some of the mistakes you see that, that kind of create friction throughout the process and ultimately can cause issues as far as getting the loan to the, the table or the, the closing? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people not being forthright and disclosing quote unquote negative information, right? So um, we'll get a deal and we'll get it pre-approved. And we do we do a very extensive write-up before we even issue an LOI. Some banks will just give you an LOI and means nothing. We actually go to our credit administrator and he's the person that writes off ultimately on the deal. So what will happen is, you know, we'll go to our, we'll, we'll ask all these questions. We'll get the PFS, we'll get all this information. Yes, we issue you an LOI. We're going to underwriting and, you know, we don't really, we never backed out of an LOI unless we find out something in underwriting that we didn't know before. So we'll go into underwriting and we'll see, oh my God, you've had two bankruptcies that you didn't tell me about, right? Or your, you know, your credit score, you said it was a 700 and it's a 570. Um, you have a DUI that you didn't disclose. You have, you know, a criminal record that you didn't disclose. So those are really, that, that's the kind of thing that I see slowing deals down. And also another thing that slows deals down is 
not providing the proper information in a timely manner. We need time to process the information that we receive, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll set a closing date, let's just say of November 30th. And, you know, there's a process, right? You need to provide us information throughout the process and you wait November 29th and you're like, well, how come we're not closing? Well, we don't have, we didn't have, oh, well, here it is now. So you had mentioned that, uh, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of situations, what ends up happening is that the lender, you know, ends up getting blamed, quote unquote, when in reality, a lot of times it's just the the, the lack of proactiveness when it comes to the other parties in the transaction. And, and, I, and I would agree with you in, in a lot of ways, too, because I've had that situation in the past happen to me where it's, you know, the, 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 the buyers taking a little bit longer than they need to 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 get the appropriate information to the parties that, 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 that re- require the information and it causes issues as far as getting to the finish line. So um, I couldn't agree more on that front. So last question before we open up the Q&A, uh, what, what are some of the resources that you would recommend for those individuals who want to learn more about the SBA process? Um, you know, this, this applies both to business owners, you know, and even, even brokers. I know there's a lot of brokers that, that tune into the, the call as well. So if you could share some information, I think that'd be great. You know, I, I, I think one of the best resources, believe it or not, is LinkedIn. And, um, and I'm not saying I was the first one to do it, but I was one of the first people that started um, posting videos about SBA and SBA products. And now there are a lot of people that are doing that. So if you want, you know, just a quick little bite about just the SBA process and things like that, LinkedIn has great resources um, you know, other than that, you can go on any bank's website and they have literature on SBA, their SBA products, including ours. And, um, and also really, you know, the SOP, it's for the SBA, but it, operating procedures, but it's, you know, a thousand pages. So, um, but, you know, honestly, that is a really good resource. You can go in and you can just search what you're looking for. And it'll come up and you will see, um, you, you will, you will get the answers that, that you need. Awesome. And, and I would even encourage you guys to reach out to Patty, um, cause she is a phenomenal resource. And so if you guys are looking for, you know, any type of SBA financing, I would encourage you guys to reach out to her cause she really does a great job. So, all right. So another thing that I was kind of curious about is if, if, if you guys uh, want to type away in the chat box, uh, I will be checking our live stream as well. Um, so feel free to type away any questions you may have. Um, like I said, Patty, we actually have people tuning in that are, you know, brokers, investors, business owners, et cetera. So yep. hopefully we have a, a, a dialogue that we can pursue. And, and I guess one, one question I'll have just as, as people are typing away is what are some of the, uh, you know, maybe a question that you, maybe I didn't ask you that you think would be pertinent to the discussion that you think sure. a lot of people have either misconceptions about, or, you know, maybe I should have asked you to begin with. Sure. I, th- I think one thing that is important to point out is what happens if you're buying a business and the property together. Mm. Okay. So if you're buying a business and property together, the best way to structure this transaction is to do one seven a loan. And here's why, because if the business is worth one dollar, I'm sorry, if the property is worth $1 more than the business, so property value is higher than the business, you can go out 25 years on the entire loan. Okay, so that's great. If the business is worth more than the property, you can do a blended amortization. So typically business acquisition loans are 10 years, commercial real estate, 25 years, right? But you'll do a blended amortization, which comes out to about 15 years, and you'll still only have one loan that you have to deal with. So I think that's really something that people should know and take advantage of because you can do 25 years on the whole thing if the business is worth more. I mean, if the property is worth more. Interesting. So in that, would that fall under the, the 504 product in that situation? Seven, or seven, eight. Seven. Oh, wow. So the, the seven, eight can extend up to that, that, that timeline yeah. if, oh, okay. Yeah, seven is or 25 years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. Oh yeah. yeah. It, I so guess it's real estate is 25. Years. Oh, with real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if it's just an acquisition, it's I think what, 10 years is it or 15 it's 10 years. But if, if you're doing them, if the property is worth more than the business, you can go out 25 years on the business and on uh, the commercial real estate. That's great to know. I did not yeah. know that. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. I'll let you guys uh, type away. If you guys have any questions in particular, I'd I love it. Wasn't an SBA express loan. I think I see that question. Oh, is there a, where is that? I can't, is it in the chat? chat? It's in yep. the chat. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me see. 
SBA Express. Uh, could you could you read it out? I, for some reason, I can't see it. Maybe it's because I got because I. I'll do your job, Ralph. Don't worry. Thank you. I appreciate. What, it. <laughs> what is an SBA Express loan? So an SBA Express loan is a loan. Uh, it's now up to five hundred thousand dollars, and um, it's typically used for working capital needs. Um, I don't know anybody that provides an SBA Express loan for anything other than that. Not to say that there aren't banks out there that will that will do it, but it's typically used for working capital. And um, it's, it's now the, they're changing the standards. So on an SBA, SBA Express loan, it used to be three fifty and under. Now it's five hundred thousand dollars and under. But on three fifty and under, you don't have to pledge collateral. Okay, so the SBA requires that if you have collateral, that means a piece of property, a home, and you have more than 25% equity in that property, you have to pledge that. If you don't have those properties, that's okay. You don't have to worry about it. But with an SBA Express, $350,000 and under, generally in SBA, you don't have to pledge collateral. So that's what an SBA Express loan is. Um, again, it's used for smaller deals. We don't do those standalone. We will do those in conjunction with the term loan. So we'll do a business acquisition loan or a commercial real estate loan, and then you need a lot working capital line of credit. We'll do an SBA Express loan in conjunction with that. Great, 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 uh, great advice. So it looks All like right. the next one, it's Adade, if, if that's correct. I just want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Or is that, was there another question you, because when I, when I jumped off, when I fall off the, the, yeah. the, the yeah. So it says, um, where does a self-storage asset class fall under high risk? Yes, it's 7A. Self-storage is 7A. And then now you can take it. I think it Okay, be- thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I was, <laughs> when I dropped off the, the chat, like I wiped out. So I didn't see the first two questions. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, so next up is, I believe, I, Adade. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Um, but he said, for a startup business with less than three years of, a t- of tax returns, is there any workaround? Uh, that's tough, right? That's tough. Um, I think you just have to, at th- that point, have to try to mitigate the risk. Uh, we don't do pure startups. I don't really know any bank that does a pure, pure startup, right? We'll do an expansion. So for example, you currently have a business, you want to buy another location, and that location is going to be a startup. You know, we'll, We're willing to look at that. But um, without historical cash flows, it's going to be really, really tough. If you have one to two years of cash flow, historical cash flow, and you have really good projections and things are going in the right direction, then I think that's the workaround to the three-year requirement. But you really have to be knocking it out of the park and really be a sol- solid in you know, the past couple of years, and your projections have to be solid. Definitely. Great, great, uh, great share. Uh, so Eric, he asks, is there a loan minimum on an SBA loan on a self-storage facility? Is there also a maximum? So he wants to know the minimum and maximum. Uh, there is no minimum. The minimum is really what the bank is willing to do. Uh, but the maximum loan amount on an SBA is $5 million. So again, that will depend bank per bank as far as what their appetite is, what you know, how low they want to go or how high they want to go. We try to stay... We try to save five hundred thousand dollars and above, but I will do you know something less than that just to help somebody out. And um, we'll probably you know on a self storage, we you know potentially do a five million dollar loan again, depending on the self storage. But yeah, maximum is five million. Yeah, and that's for the loan. So if you wanted to buy like an eight million dollar self storage facility, you have to come to the table with the three million. I'm assuming, or and yep. then yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. So David asks, uh, hey, hey, David, he said, uh, what, under what conditions can you use an SBA loan to buy commercial real estate? Anything other than self-storage, car wash, et cetera? Well, yeah, you, you can use an SBA loan, again, 504 to buy anything or 7A to buy an, any piece of property as long as it's owner occupied. OK, so I think that's, thing, that's one thing we have to consider. And that means you, you occupy it by at least 51 percent. The person using the property. That's really the only restriction. So whether you go 7A or 504, again, it, it depends on the risk. Any property that's high risk, single use, you would typically do a 7A on that property. Anything else that's more general, you would do a 504. And and just to clarify with 504, you, you're, the term, uh, the interest rate is, is typically fixed in that scenario? It's fixed and lower and mm-hmm. lower. Yes. Okay. So I, I, when, when we weren't doing 504s, I was turning away a lot of business, but at the end of the day, you know, it's about doing what's best for the client. No, I understand. No, for sure. Yeah. Let's see. I had, one, I had a question that I was going to actually ask you. Uh, 
Oh, so um, I had a question on my on the tip of my tongue. It was related to, um, oh, so one of the interesting trends that we were seeing, and this is just a separate industry, is the uh, the the cannabis industry. And obviously, there's other types of industries out there. They're they're starting to become a little bit more prevalent in other in certain markets as things start turning around different state to state. I'm assuming the SBA is not handling that as, as of yet, or is that is that is that different? So like the retail component versus the warehousing, et cetera. Right. No, SBA isn't doing that right now because it's it's it has to be um, legal federally before the SBA mm-hmm. will even think about doing it. That makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, the you know, SBA is a government program. So at, at this time, it's not an eligible use of proceeds. If it were, I, I'd be a millionaire and I'd be in the Bahamas somewhere because <laughs> I get a lot of requests. So so one of the things I'm curious about is are there particular uses that you know just aren't eligible for the SBA financing? Just business uses. Um, well, and anything that's not legal under under the sure. federal government, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so you have any uh, any type of like money service business. So you you can't lend with SBA financing. So you can't take the SBA money and lend with it. So th- those are the main ones that you know anything that that's related to. Um, uh, drugs or yeah. things like that. You, it's just not, it's not SBA eligible. That makes sense. Would that fall like, like uh, smoke shops and, and, and alcohol, you know, exactly. stores? That now, again, I mean, some people will do, I mean, some banks will do smoke shops, but we won't do them if, if they're selling any type of paraphernalia, sure. Yeah. Um, things of that nature, but some banks will, if, if that's all they're selling, we won't do that. No, that makes sense. No, for sure. So Eric asks, is there any asset class in which the SBA looks at with more favor? So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I would say, you know, any any general use property, right? So anything mm-hmm. that is not high risk, anything that's not single use, that's definitely preferred because, again, it's a lower risk. Um, if the loan, for example, goes bad or the business goes bad, you can always just plug in someone in, into that property and selling it will be a lot easier if the bank has to end up doing that. So I would say the asset classes with the lowest risk, which are general purpose use properties. Yeah. Great, nice. All right, let me check the chat real quick. Would you be willing to share, I guess, I mean, it may be a recent uh, uh, project you worked on and maybe share, um, you know, some of the, some of the lessons learned or hurdles that you guys had to overcome. I think that'd be kind of nice to have at least some context as to how the process works. Sure. So, um, we did a, uh, we actually did a commercial real estate property where we, it was the buying of the commercial real estate and the business together. And it was an auto mechanic shop. And again, very high risk industry. We ended up doing it. We did, um, working capital as well. And we also finance all of the closing costs, all of the fees. So that, that's really a benefit. So we did that property and nobody else would touch it. No other bank would touch this because, again, it was a high risk industry. We ended up doing it. Um, but I think one of the lessons learned is, again, I was I, I think we were discussing it earlier. This was property where um, the borrower had some credit issues and they didn't disclose the credit issues. And what what that did is that told us, well, not me, but our credit administrator was like, well, how come this person didn't disclose it? Doesn't make you seem very honest, correct? So um, we were eventually able to overcome it because there were really good reasons as to why the credit credit issues were happening. Um, it was it was medical medical related, um, so we were able to get around that. But again, please disclose everything up front, um, not just credit issues, but concentrations, for example. A lot of people don't dis- disclose these concentrations on their business. And then when it comes to you know, financing, we're like, well, how come we didn't disclose the concentrations? It makes, it, it, that just makes everyone's life difficult. So I, w- I would say that, that that's really one, one story that you know, we were ready to go and it was so high risk and we were just, you know, we were so happy to get it done and everyone was so happy and then, you know, gosh, now we have to deal with credit issues. Oh, for sure. And then, like you said, that, that just elongates the process. And that kind of leads us to the, the next question, which Eric has asked is how long is the typical loan process? 
It varies from bank to bank, okay? But I, I can tell you for us, it's around 60 days. Um, do you think, Ralph, it would be helpful for me to go through the process? Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be very helpful. Well, this is our process. So we, um, we will send you a needs list. And once you provide everything that's required on that needs list, we may have some questions. But then we do a full write-up and we go to our credit administrator. And between three to five business days, we can issue you an LOI. Um, and as I indicated, our LOIs are really just as good as commitment letters, unless you're not disclosing things that you should disclose in the front end, right? But we'll issue an LOI between three to five business days. Uh, borrower signs the LOI, sends that back to us. Then we go into full underwriting, which will take about two weeks. And if there's nothing weird or strange that we find out in underwriting that we didn't know before, we will issue you a commitment letter. You sign the commitment letter, you send that back. And then we go into the closing. It is two to three weeks for a, a business or a business valuation or an appraisal. And then you also have two to three weeks for closing needless items. So I would say it's about 45 to 60 days, but I would give yourself 60 days to, um, to be safe. And again, 60 working days. That means 60 days that we're actually working on the deal. So you can't you know, be MIA for two weeks and be like, well, I still want to meet that 60 day deadline. It just doesn't work that way. That makes sense. Yeah, Not for sure. So one thing uh, I think jo uh, Johnson was asking, uh, you had mentioned concentrations a little bit earlier. Can you specify what that, that means? Yes, that means your business has um, has clients with that are heavily concentrated, like you only have two to three clients, mm -hmm. or you have a client that has, you know, 80% of your business. So any that those are really client concentrations that, you know, you have one, one client or a few clients that make up the bulk of your business. And that's not good. That's risky, right? Because if you lose one client, that could be the majority of your business and your business is shot. So you also, you always want to have it, you know, diverse client base. Yeah. And, and I guess with the, the documentation they provide you, where would that typically be? Where would you typically see that? Like, it, you know, what, what type of document would that be referenced in? That, that would, well, that, that would be in, in the business plan and business mm -hmm. information, right? So yeah. that's really important to, mm -hmm. to disclose and, and it would be in the business information that you're, you're that you're providing for us. Sure. That makes sense. All right. Well, looks like um, I'll give it a minute more just to see if anyone else has any other questions. But uh, I know you provide a ton of great value today. So, um, you know, I, I know for the you guys who are listening, I, I did I did have my uh, computer go dark briefly, but we'll get that all edited out. So that's not a not a big deal. So you guys will have this uh, ready to go to be able to listen to, uh, you know, again and again. And like I said, we need to Make sure that you guys reach out to Patty with any other questions and hopefully you guys can actually do business together because I think it'd be great uh, for everyone. So, And, you know, I, I just wanted to anyone that's watching or hearing this, mm -hmm. you, you can contact me with any questions that you have. I'm more than happy to answer them, even if it's not me doing the loan or even, you know, it's not about that. So I just want to be able to help help you guys and the SBA community. So feel free to reach out with any questions that you have. You can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. No, definitely. And, and last question before we, we, we allow uh, uh, Patty to share her contact, because I think that's going to be important, is Eric asks, is there any particular bank that focuses on SBA? It depends on what type of SBA financing you're looking for. So um, all banks pretty much do SBA, right? Mm -hmm. um, but some banks will do SBA financing that other banks won't. So there's not one in particular. Um, however, if you're looking for non-collateralized lending. So that's not commercial real estate, you know, lending where it's, you're, you're doing a business acquisition, there's, there isn't enough collateral in the deal. There, there aren't a lot of banks that do this type of financing. We're one of them, uh, Live Oak does it, uh, First Bank of the Lake, they're very, very active in non-collateralized financing. So these are the three banks that I would say that do this type of financing. And again, for commercial real estate, it really depends on um, what you're trying to finance. If it's a special to use property, if it's a single use purpose property, not a lot of banks do those. Most banks don't even touch those. Uh, again, we're one of the few banks that I know that do those types of properties. But anything in general, if you're just gonna do a 504, uh, really the best banks to go to are the larger banks because they have the lowest fees. So if your client is a paper, Go to the larger banks because they can give you um, a really great rate with a really great structure. Don't even bother with any other lender, even like myself. 
Um, so, you know, so I, I would do a 504 on a, you know, B, B paper type deal. A paper, I would send it to a big bank. Yeah, B, B, B versus A paper means like credit wise, I'm assuming, right? Where it- uh, yeah, or, or the deal, right? The deal. So there's there's some hair on the deal there's you know maybe some issues here and there it's not the perfect deal because the you know wells and chase and those banks they want a perfect deal right when it comes Mm -hmm. when it comes to this type of financing but if it's not um if there's some credit issues something like that then you know you would you would go through another type of bank like me or a smaller bank for sure that's awesome well, Patty, you know, we really appreciate your time. I know your time is valuable and, you know, it's always great to connect, reconnect and, and, and have conversations with you. So if people want to learn more about you, uh, you know, or get in touch uh, to, to talk about SBA financing, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the best way to do that, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Patty Asai, uh, it's P-A-T-T-I-E-E-H-S-A-E-I, and uh, that's really the best way, or you can go to our website, um, at localfirstbank.com. And um, there you'll, you'll go to the SBA page and you'll see that there's a, there's a really great way to contact me there as well. Absolutely. And for those of you guys who are watching this on, are going to be watching this on YouTube or listening to this in a podcast format, it'll be in the description below. So if you guys want to get in touch with Patty, we'll provide their her LinkedIn uh, page, her contact information, phone number, email, et cetera. So uh, feel free to reach out. Well, Patty, thanks again. Really so much for, for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I, we had a, someone ask when this will be on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube by tomorrow. Um, so you guys will have access to it as well. Uh, for those of you guys who tuned in, we greatly appreciate all your guys' support. Uh, it really is amazing to see the, the, the reach that we've been able to achieve as a result of our just continually doing this on a day-to-day ba- or on a month, bi-monthly basis. Um, feel free to stop by again. Again, we do this on a bi-monthly basis. Every, every two weeks, we invite a speaker to come in and talk about a variety of different commercial real estate topics. So thanks again so much for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time. See ya. Ciao.